What's up? This is Brandon London, and you're listening to the Big Blue UK and Ireland podcast. You hear that? The Big Blue UK and Ireland podcast. Let's go, Giants. Welcome back, Giants fans, to the latest bonus edition of the Big Blue UK and Ireland podcast. Uh, this week we are 100% British, but absolutely still 100% Giants. We're minus Kev, but we've got a very, very special guest in for you today, Giants fans. Uh, none other than journalist and writer for The Athletic. Uh, follows the Giants all year round and is the main reason I subscribe to The Athletic every month. It's uh, Mr. Dan Duggan joins us on the podcast today. Afternoon, Dan, how are you? Or should I say morning? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Appreciate that. And I'm Irish, so I guess I can fill in and uh, round it out here. Well, there you go. It's almost like it's written in the stars for you to be on today. <laughs> Minus our Irish contingent today, you can be the you can fly the trickler today for us. That's great. <laughs> um, but no, really, thanks sir, for coming on, man. We really, really appreciate it. And obviously, no, it's a busy time of year for you, so I appreciate you taking the time out to come and speak with us. Um, even though we're thousands of miles away, we're uh, we're still just as passionate about the Giants as uh, some uh, some of the fans over the, on your side of the pond. So yeah, really appreciate your time, man. Absolutely, guys. Craig, Shane, how you doing? Yeah, all good. Um, it's nice jumping on for a bonus episode, and yeah, I echo everything that Dan said. It's great to have you on, Dan. Um, again, I'm a subscriber and. You know, love reading the articles and the tweets and can only imagine how, how busy it is. So, like, you know, massive thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us on here today. I'm yeah, putting, absolutely. Uh, happy to be here. Putting up with my persistence as well after... I think I messaged you, like, beginning of last season last year. Um, yeah. And we, we exchanged the, the email and uh, a kind of time must have got away from us. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming back to me and uh, let's get cracking. Now listen, I'm I'm big on. I always follow up with people, and I'll badger people in my job. So I certainly can't uh, hold it against anybody else that does the same. You got to do, got to do that. <laughs> yeah, results, you so. you got to take, you got to take as good as you can give, right? Exactly, exactly. Cool, man. Um, yeah, we're just going to rattle off. So we've got some questions that we want to ask you, and obviously to get things from your perspective, um, and just sort of just give our listeners a bit of an idea as to as to who you are and to what you do and and why the Giants, I suppose. So um, we just want to go back sort of to your sort of early sort of sporting memories, as in like, what was your earliest sporting memory as a child? Like, what's the first thing you remember about sport? Wow, going way back there. Um, so, I mean, I grew up in Boston, so that's like, you know, enemy territory, obviously, to okay. be covering a New York team. Uh, and I was just like sports obsessed. So, I mean, I couldn't even say my earliest memory because it's funny, I have a two-year-old son right now. And he literally sleeps with footballs in his bed and like he makes me, you know, throw the ball to him even though he can't catch it or hit it yet. Like so I think I was pretty much the same way. So it's kind of been just in my DNA from from day one. Uh, so I guess it worked out like I obviously until you're about like twelve or fourteen, I wanted to be a professional athlete. And you know, at some point their reality set in that probably wasn't gonna happen. So this is kind of the next best thing where I at least still get to be around sports and you know, it doesn't really feel like work when you get to uh, you know, watch games and, and talk about it and tweet about it and all this other stuff that, you know, I'd be doing if I wasn't covering it. So it, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, even better you get paid for it, right? <laughs> you can't beat it. So you get, you get paid for doing something you love and talking about something you love. So you can't really beat that. Um, so obviously growing up in Boston then, um, what sports teams did you follow? Yeah, so I mean, obviously kind of the, the ones you'd expect. I um, was a diehard Red Sox fan when I was younger. And not really a big baseball guy anymore. That kind of had to go by the wayside. There's only so many hours in the day and uh, 162 games just kind of became tough with uh, a yeah. wife and kids and uh, how much time I spent with football. But, yeah, Patriots, Celtics. It wasn't really a huge hockey guy, but, you know, I would jump on the Bruins bandwagon. But the, the main three were uh, definitely Red Sox, Patriots, and then Celtics. Nice. So Boston through and through then no doubt. when it comes to sports teams. Cool. Do you still follow any of them? No, it's funny. You know, and as a thing where a lot of – you know, when I kind of came out early on that I was from Boston and people think I was like this still a Patriots fan. It's like, you know, you kind of lose that fandom when you get into this business. Like, I, you know, when I my first job out of college, I was working at the Boston Herald and Ian Rappaport actually was at the Boston Herald covering the Patriots at the time. So he's a great guy to, to learn from and work with. But a lot of times he would, um, 
you know, a bit of a road game on a Sunday and Belichick being Belichick would have his press conference on Monday at like 8 a.m. or some ungodly early hour. <laughs> yep. So none of the main beat reporters, you know, they don't charter a flight home like the team does, could ever get there. So I'd be the poor sap. I'm like 24, 25 years old. And it was one of the, I forgot, I remember, it might have been like 2009, so I was like 25. And they weren't bad. They were like 10 and 6, 11 and 5, but they had some bad losses. They had some controversies. So I'd have to be, so you know. Was that the, was that the Matt, Matt Castle year? Or just after? No, it was a year after. I, mean, I, think it was, I think it was 09. They had some big free agents that didn't really pan out. Um, again, they had some bad losses. It was a year they lost to the Colts, where they went for it on like fourth and two late in the game. I think it was 09. Oh, yeah. Anyways, I'd have to go trembling into these press cards just to ask Belichick like hard questions. And you just get that <laughs> nothing, you know, you shoot it down, <laughs> just stares at you. And it just, you know. So my, my long, that's a long way to say that, like, that kind of beat the fandom out of you. I didn't then go home and be like, oh, I love Bill Belichick. You know, it becomes a job and everything becomes a job. And you just, you're dealing with so many people. So you look, you know, you might root for people to some extent. I will say, I will confess that, like, I didn't really care how the Patriots did. But, like, if they're in the Super Bowl, like Tom Brady, I was a fan of him before I got into this business. I was in high school and college when he was one of those first couple of Super Bowls. So I did always have a soft spot for Tom Brady. So, like, when he's with the Bucs, I still, you know, I still want to see him do well. Uh, but the, the kind of rooting part, that went by the wayside. The only team I really probably still root for is the Celtics because basketball is actually my favorite sport, and I've been sort of separated them for so long that I don't know any of the coaches, any of the players, so I can just watch that in the springtime. You know, I'll jump on the bandwagon in the playoffs. They've always been pretty good, and uh, I get to just have fun as a fan because it's not anything I deal with on a daily basis at all. Yeah, man, so the, uh, the, you must be pretty happy this year with the Celtics doing well, right? Yeah, no, it's great. Like I said, that, that's the fun part because I can, I can just kind of – root for that and not have to like, you know, consider, you know, again, like the Patriots are good or bad to me. It doesn't make any difference. I'm working all day Sunday. Anyways, I, I get to score maybe when I get home or I, I'll see my friends group chat exploding when they're, you know, they're not doing well and everyone's ready to fire everyone. But other than that, um, yeah, the Celtics are the only team I actually really kind of will root for at this point. Cool. You can just sit back, relax and enjoy the game. That's cool. Exactly. Um, so talking basketball, so you're director of the O'Connell Thompson basketball tournament, uh, which has been going since 06. How did that come about? Oh yeah, wise. Well, you did you did the research. So um yeah, that was Thanks actually two that's that's producer Craig right there. <laughs> okay. Um yeah, well two of my friends actually passed away while I was in college. So we started a, a memorial tournament for them uh in 06, which was the year I graduated college. It ran for fourteen years and then unfortunately it was a, a casualty of COVID because we couldn't do it that first year. And then the next year was still kind of dodgy to do it, and we just uh, you know, it it's actually I guess it's officially over. I guess I haven't officially ended it on my LinkedIn or have you found that, but um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of a labor of love. You know, it was, we raised money for scholarship uh, funds that set up at the high school. It's a good way to get, um, you know, a lot of people in the community together and that type of thing. But yeah, then, unfortunately COVID just kind of put an end to that with like, as it did with a lot of things. Yeah, man. 2020 was a hard year for a lot of people. And uh, it's a shame because if, you, if you're raising funds for, for kids to get scholarships and stuff like that, which is going to help in the future in regards to their education, you know, to have something like COVID and bring that to an end is a bit of a shame, really, because it, it's obviously helped out a lot of kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, you know, and we made, you know, we raised a couple hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks. It was more just for the, the camaraderie of getting everyone together. And, you know, again, I love playing basketball. So it's fun just to have a you know a good basketball tournament every summer to look forward to. So, yeah, no, it was definitely bittersweet. But at the same time, like I said, I got a, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, it was kind of getting, <laughs> getting harder to find the time. It's a lot of work that goes into organizing something like that. So um, Priorities. Yeah. So I guess it was probably, it was probably uh, meant to run its course at some point anyway. And COVID just kind of expedited the process. Yeah, sort of bought it forward a few years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cool. So, great. You, so you um you said about obviously you wanted to be a, a as, as we probably all did when we were kids as well. You always look up at sportsmen. Um. So what was it that led you to pursue journalism as you, as the career then? Yeah, I mean, it was literally just kind of like uh, looking at it practically. Like, again, I really wanted to be involved in sports, and I was good at writing. So it just kind of like seemed like an <laughs> obvious thing to marry him. Like I was like. When I was in elementary school, you know, we had to do journals every day in like first and second grade. And I would just write like basically sports articles because I'd read, I'd read the newspaper, I'd read Sports Illustrated, I'd read all that stuff. And it's funny, I still remember when my like, second grade teacher was like, like would write like, oh, you're going to be a sports writer someday. So, you know, <laughs> Mrs. Herbert, shout out to you. She called it long before anyone else did. But yeah, I've just always been obsessed with sports. And like I said, it, it kind of married. I had some talent writing, had the passion for sports. So like 
I don't know. I just hope I can ride this as long as it can. I can't really do anything else. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> it's so long. I, I got I got to get like thirty more years prior to retirement. So you know the way this industry is going, that's a little daunting. But you know, if I can make it, uh, I'll be very happy because I, I love doing it. Oh, awesome. I mean, Dan's already kind of rumbled me as doing a bit of research and actually looking into some stuff here. So, uh, so you started with NewJersey.com covering Rutgers football after Boston. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I was in, yeah, so I was in Boston. I, like I said, I graduated college in '06. I uh, worked at the Herald till 2012. Then moved down here in, in 2012 and um, got my kind of break down here covering Rutgers football for mm -hmm. NJ.com, the Star Ledger, kind of the big outlet in New Jersey. So I covered Rutgers for the 2013, 14, and 15 seasons. And then when Jordan Renan, he was at NJ.com covering the Giants when he left to go to ESPN. I got bumped up to take his spot at NJ.com covering the Giants. Uh, so covered the Giants at NJ.com for two years and then have been at the Athletics since 2018. So altogether, I've, I've done seven years, which is like crazy on the Giants. But time flies. Uh, but yeah, so in the five, I'm at the Athletic. So after covering the Giants for that long, is it how, does it, how do you word this? Do you go for a fan or is it an affiliation that you you kind of are with the team do you get the opportunity to really be a fan or or do you just kind of look at it as this is the team i kind of follow so there's a little bit there yeah yeah i guess affiliation is probably a good word certainly not fan i think like you know in this in this role you really can't be a fan um you know, you have to write objectively. You have to, especially the team's been bad, so it'd be really hard. <laughs> it's been hard to cover the team as a fan for you know five out of the seven yeah. years been on the beat. Um, so yeah, you try to be, you know, you try to be fair. I mean, when they're good, you want to write positively. When they're bad, you you have to write, you know, cover the negative aspects. But yeah, so I definitely not a fan. I mean, again, there's you're still a human, and there's players or coaches or p people in the organization that you like. You try not to let that shade your coverage any more than there's people you don't like, and, and let that influence your coverage. But you know, that is probably something you have to balance uh and i hope to try and do a good job of that but yeah no you really like i said you just can't be a fan because again you're like you're doing a job so like the result of the game doesn't really impact my day it's kind of like how things go like was the press conference running late was the locker room you know not a lot of players were in it stuff like that is what you start to get so involved in the minutia of like your job like whether mm -hmm. they win or lose doesn't i mean obviously when they go to the playoffs that has an impact when they're you know three and 13 that has an impact but kind of day-to-day -day, how the team is doing doesn't have a, a drastic impact so you know i don't really root necessarily for wins and losses i root for uh like we all do probably in our in our lives selfishly what makes my job easier and better so that, that's kind of my main uh, focus people day -day. people talk and make your life easier right 100 percent, yeah like, you know like a guy like came on thibodeau like that, that those types of guys are welcome you know you want some personality you want guys with uh who aren't afraid to, to say some stuff and make some headlines, you know? It's like, or like Daniel Jones, it's like you can just kind of skip his media interviews because you know he's he's never going to say anything. So uh, <laughs> you need you need some personalities to balance the Daniel Joneses of the world out. Yeah, man, I think Shane. Yeah, I was just going to move on to the next sort of questions unless you had anything. Go for it. Um, so I was just going to ask, obviously the NFL season officially runs September through to February, if you're, you're lucky enough for some of the teams. Um, but as we spoke just before we went on the air, you've had a busy week this week, and next week's going to pick up as well. So you technically, you know, it's an all year round business with the draft, etc. So when when do you personally get downtime, and do you ever get chance to have a vacation, and you have to literally plan everything around the NFL season or when the off season? Yeah, no, I definitely plan my life around the NFL season. Uh, like my my kids are born and. March and May, and obviously some of that was out of me, my wife's hands. But that was kind of the time of year we were targeting, at least. We, I don't, you know, I have friends on the beat and stuff who've had babies in August, and I don't know how you do it. Like during the heart of training camp and into the season, it's like that's a that's a busy time. So uh, that worked out well. But yeah, it wasn't an accident. I got married in July. That wasn't an accident. You know, you really have to, um, you know, when my anniversary every year isn't you know on a weekend where there's a game. So that, that was certainly part of uh, even those types of decisions. But yeah, like. What I always say to people, a lot of people don't know really much about it. Like, what do you do in the off season? And it's kind of like, what off season? Because the NFL is really smart about how they've made this a year-round business where it seems like every month there's some sort of, you know, kind of tent pole event where it's the combine, then it's free agency, then it's the draft, then it's like mini camp. So the way I describe it to people, it's like, say August 1st to, we'll say, it used to be January 1st, now the season goes a little longer. If the team doesn't make the playoffs, you're working pretty much every day. Like, you know, you're either at the facility, you're traveling to games, you're at games. Like, 
there's practices, there's training camp is a grind. So you're, you're working six days a week minimum and you're thinking about it all the time. But let's just say January 1st to August 1st, I'm working from home like 95% of the time. I mean, you'll go to the facility for a couple of mini camp practices. You'll go for the, the three days of the draft. But more, more often than not, I'm working from home. So that's nice. It's a ton of flexibility. I can work on my own time. Um, and then, yeah, as far as down, like real, real downtime, it, the, there's about a six week window from when mini camp ends in mid June to training camp starts in late July, where like the entire NFL world unplugs. And it's a beautiful thing because really nothing happens. You know, knock on yep. wood, you hope there's no off the field issues like the DeAndre Baker thing. I think that happened on Memorial Day weekend, I want to say, or around there. So you hope nothing like that happens during your <laughs> off season. But, uh, and I know JPP was obviously July 4th. So those types of things you want to avoid. Uh, but generally speaking, there's not a lot of transactions. That's the time even the coaches and the GMs, they actually, you know, like get to know their family again and that type of stuff. So that that's the best time of year in terms of being able to unplug, not have to be checking your phone, you know, constantly. And then there's just pockets throughout the offseason. Like, actually, once the Giants got eliminated from the playoffs, no coaching search, no GM search, that like two or three weeks before the Super Bowl wasn't bad because the NFL world's still moving on, but the Giants were kind of in like a holding pattern and there wasn't much going on with them day to day. So that was nice. And, and now it's... It's certainly revving up again. You know, free agency, first three to four days of free agency are probably three of the four busiest days of the year right up there with the draft. And then following on with like when it's in the actual season, um, so do you get to go to every single Giants game? And also, what is a typical game day like for yourself? Yeah, so I do. I do um, other than COVID, I've gone to every road game, I want to say, since I've been on the beat with the exception of the London game this year. It was just, uh, you know, Aww. we sent our we sent our Packers writer, you know, there's budgetary issues. I actually had a wedding that weekend, so it kind of worked out well because I've, I've missed a lot of weddings in the fall uh, through the yeah, years. Uh, but, yeah, I went to the first London, not the first London game, the first London game since I was in the beat in 2016 when they played the Rams. So, yeah, I've, I go to every game, uh, again, with a rare exception. And, yeah, game day is funny. I think it was – this is what you do in the losing season. I think it was 2019. I actually wrote a diary – of what it's like covering a, a hopeless team, as I think was the headline was, because that was when they were really bad and they had lost like 10 or 11, 12 games in a row, whatever it was that year. You, you know, so, I really, <laughs> so I really documented it because I figured like if they're playing the Packers, you knew they're going to get blown out. I was like, I just can't write another just cookie cutter story off of another loss. So it was kind of fun. I took people in, inside of it. Um, so I'll give you a, a brief summation, but people can look that up if they want to get a real detailed look at it. So let's say it's a one o'clock home game. That's probably the you know, most standard thing. You know, I'm, I'm up and out the door. You got to do, you know, little house duties, walk the dog, do, you know, get the kids breakfast, whatnot, because then my wife, she's going to have them all day. So I try to do what I can in the morning. But I like to get to the stadium early, like 8.30 ideally. So I'm there like, you know, four, four and a half hours before the game and just get set up, not be rushed, beat the traffic. A lot of times pregame, you're just looking at stuff like if there's injuries or you can see like, you know, what the inactives might look like based on who's doing what or if there's any lineup changes, you can get a peek at that in warm-ups. Then obviously the game starts at one. That ends around four. Then it's probably about an hour there where you're getting down to the uh, where the post game stuff is, where it's the tables, press conference, open locker room. That you know, give or take an hour. Then you're back up at the press box. I take kind of a long time, I write longer articles. If you guys are subscribers, you're probably aware of that. So let's. Yeah. Uh, a goal of there is to file up. I say eight p.m. and sometimes that might be uh, that might be a little optimistic. Might be a little later. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully I'm home by 8.39. And at that point, I'm just wiped. So I'll sit there, you know, hopefully it's a decent Sunday night football game on. And I'll just kind of – that's usually when I catch up. I don't really even look at my mentions during the game. It's just there's too much going on. So I'll go, I'll go through Twitter. And it's kind of fun because you see a lot of stuff, you know, what people are tweeting live. And obviously the games have so many twists and turns. And, and you'll see, like, how the fan base was ready to, like, you know, fire everybody and, you know, cut this guy. And then they end up winning the game, how much the tone changes. So I actually enjoy doing that. It's, like, how, it's kind of like how I – decompress uh, at the end of the day but it's, it's a long day i mean again back to the first thing i was saying i love it it's not i'm not complaining about it but it, those game days are definitely you know it's like a probably a 12 hour day at work and then it's just you know you're just you're kind of at the end of that you're just kind of worn out but then, like you said it's a, it's a labor of love so it's not something you don't Absolutely. necessarily not enjoy and um yeah i think going back to last season um you, obviously, you said like we've, you've covered the team when it's been a bit hopeless over the last few years. But going back to last season, obviously, it was a bit more hopeful. Uh, it was a huge improvement on recent years. Uh, anything that you could change about the season from a Giants perspective, what would it be and why? 
Yeah. Anything I could change about the season? Yeah, so I guess if the Giants had uh, the opportunity to rerun the season, what would, would there be anything you would change about it? Or that okay. they would change about it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess uh, either have Adore Jackson not return punts or have Xavier McKinney <laughs> stay home during the bye week. Because uh, <laughs> otherwise, I mean, the, you know, a lot went well. You know, I mean, obviously you can sit there and really, you know, if you want, really want to like time travel and say, you know, beat the Eagles. I mean, I, I don't think that was going to happen, but um, but it, it's something more, a little more realistic and attainable. Yeah, I mean, if if Adori and McKinney don't get hurt, uh, you know, I think that that second half where they scuffled a bit, probably you know those games probably turn out a little bit better. So I would say that's probably the thing that's kind of realistic. That uh, if you could change, you know, one of those two things, um, it might benefit the team. Again, I don't know that it really would have changed the end result because I, I just think the Eagles were obviously a better team. So if they ran into him, that was probably how I was going to finish, but might have been a uh, an even better regular season if, if those guys stayed healthy. Cool. I don't know if Dan might have gone a little crazy there, so I'll uh, I'll crack on with his. Um, so there were pl- plenty of standouts on the, on the team last season. Um, who do you think the Giants view as the most valuable players on offense and defense? Well, it's hard to argue with most valuable on offense after they gave you know, <laughs> <laughs> Dana Jones $160 million. So I would hope they view him as the most valuable because he certainly uh, got the highest evalu- you know, valuation on the team. So, yeah, certainly that, that's all, all you need to know is, you know, contracts kind of tell you how teams really think about guys. So when you give them, make that type of commitment, they certainly believe in him. They certainly want him to be the guy, expect him to be the guy. So uh, clearly him, I think. Uh, Andrew Thomas, probably like a, a close second because, you know, that's a premier position. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, Thomas is a better left tackle than Dana Jones is a quarterback too. So he's probably in, in some respects, you could, you could make a case that he's more valuable. Uh, but again, quarterback, this is you know, the most important position on the field. Uh, so those two guys definitely jump out on offense. Uh, defensively, I think Dexter Lawrence is going to become that guy. Uh, I mean, he really had that breakout season. It sounds like they're probably going to get something done with him this off season, or at least that feels like a priority. And I would think he'll become the second highest paid guy in the team whenever that deal is done. Cause you know, that, you know, Aaron Donald is, is way up there. And then there's that next tier with like Leonard Williams and DeForest Buckner and those guys. And I think Dexter Lawrence will land somewhere in between. Like he'd probably be in like mid $20 million a year range. I mean, it's going to be a, a monster contract and, and he certainly earned it. Uh, so he's the guy that jumps out. I mean, obviously they have other guys, you know, I think McKinney is going to get paid at some point. Uh, Dory Jackson, Leonard Williams still have big contracts, but I'm not sure that, um, this regime will like re up and, and make a major investment in those two guys. You hope Thibodeau sort of becomes that guy, but I think it's I think it's pretty easy. Like if you look at, it, I think it's really Daniel Jones, and I'll give like Andrew Thomas honorable mention, and I think Dexter Lawrence on defense. Fair enough. So talking about the Jones contract, uh, anything that stood out on either of the, the on the Jones contract? Because because from our perspective, and obviously we look at it from a, from the fans, it looks like it was very. Um, clever by Joe Shane, but also by Daniel Jones in the face of both camps can almost say that they won, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I think that's a fair interpretation. I think that's, you know, you don't want to walk away like, wow, one team, you know, or one side got their clock clean at the negotiating table. And listen, we've seen examples of that, you know, the Kenny Galladay contract, uh, the Nate Solder contract, where like, you know, those sides certainly came out ahead. And of course, you know, a lot of that was based on performance. So if Daniel Jones doesn't perform well, then, you know, it looked like a bad contract for the Giants. But just looking at the structure of it, it was, it was interesting because you, know, you had that franchise tag deadline. Obviously, they came right down to the wire. And I think <laughs> I think that tag deadline gave Daniel Jones a little more leverage than the Giants because, you know, Joe Shane hasn't made a secret of it, especially after the fact. He called it the worst-case scenario. Like, they did not want to tag Daniel Jones. So I think that they had to give a little more. But, you know, with any negotiation, both sides are going to have to give something. I think the – the big win, in my opinion, for Daniel Jones is he had eighty-two million dollars guaranteed over the first two years of the deal. Like that's that's real. That's a real investment. That's real guaranteed money. That's if he got tagged twice, it would have been like eleven million less than that. So he's getting the security of not having to you know get a second tag and also eleven million dollars more, even if he was to get tagged twice. So that to me is really strong for him. And then for the Giants, I think in year three, the big win they got is having no guarantees in year three until year three comes, which, I mean, at that point, obviously, if you're still there, you're, you're going to pay him, so it doesn't matter if it's guaranteed or not. But the fact that a lot of times these big money uh, quarterback contracts, some a big chunk of the year three guarantee often triggers in year two, and no one's cutting a guy one year into this deal. Like, no matter how bad Daniel Jones is, they're not, they're not certainly going to look to cut him after one year. But maybe after two, 
And the fact that none of those guarantees in year three trigger until year three, I think that's a big win just to give them flexibility. Listen, you, you make this type of investment. You don't want to be thinking about getting out of it in two years. That, you, know, you know, that's certainly not going to be an optimal outcome. But just in terms of a guy who, you know, hasn't proven a ton, having that flexibility, I think, is a win. But I, I think, honestly, overall, I think it's, it's a strong contract for Daniel Jones. I mean, whether you think he's worth $40 million a year, but just how the contract was put together, I think he got, um, you know, some, I don't want to say concessions, but I think he got some of the things he was looking for. Um, and, uh, you know, even the incentives are, are relatively attainable. A lot of times incentives are kind of these pie-in-the-sky things, like, oh, you got to win MVP, you got to win the Super Bowl. Like, his are realistic that he can obtain some of them. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's a good deal for him. So, obviously, free agency is starting to ramp up. And today we have a certain ex-giant in Odell Beckham who's got a workout. And I believe the Giants are attending that. How likely do you reckon it is that he ends up back in blue? Oof. I mean, obviously there's some level of interest. Sorry, I just got to plug my computer in here. Uh, there's some level of interest. They wouldn't have brought him in for the uh, little free agent tour during the season. But now, you know, now he's healthy. Now he's going to have 32 teams in the market for him. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I covered Odell. I liked Odell. I don't know if it's the greatest idea to kind of go back down that road. You know, it's, it's, I think sometimes it's kind of best to just like leave things where they are at the same time. I think if the wide receiver market was stronger in free agency, you might not even have any interest, but he's probably the guy with the highest upside. You know, I mean, there's definitely some risk there. You're talking about guys 30 coming up two ACLs, but what he looked like, you know, in the second half of that season there with the Rams before he, you know, before he tore the ACL, he looked like a game changing type player and that's what the giants need. So, I really don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm really torn. Like I, I could see it happening, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't really bet on it because I just feel like there's so much water under that bridge. Like I mean, and he's going to be looking for real money. Is that where they're going to want to spend after you know, obviously, uh, all the other holes they need to address? Like I don't know. I kind of think they might patch wide receiver together this year um, with some mid level guys. But I, I definitely can't close the door, and especially you know they they brought him in during the season. They're they're at least checking him out, so there is definitely uh, a level of interest for sure. Cool. And then finally, for me today, you said fourteen million, fourteen point four million cap space. Uh, two questions. Something with Leonard Williams' contracts was one of the things you said. Uh, do you know what that something might entail? And obviously, you've also mentioned about this already, but Adoree Jackson's cap numbers rising to ten million, uh, rising by ten million this year. Do you think Shane will address that, or that it will just stay static? There's been really no chatter about Adoree. I think they're just going to like ride that one out. I mean, cornerback such an important position in this defense. They don't really have anybody else who's a proven corner, so I don't think they can get too cute there. I mean, yeah, it hurts to probably give him a twenty million dollar cap hit this year, but. Kind of is what it is. I think they ride it out. You know, it's the last year of the deal. They can, you know, move on next year, resign and whatever. I don't think they're going to uh, do anything drastic there. Yeah, with the Leonard Williams, I just said the something because it's, <laughs> it's unclear how that'll play out. Um, I don't think he'll take a pay cut. I don't see why he would. And I think if you look at everyone says, oh, take a pay cut, take a pay cut. If you're the Giants, that means you have to go to one of your best players, a guy who's, you know, played his butt off, been productive and say, you know, we don't think you're worth what you're making. Like, here's a $6 million. Because you're not going to do a $2 million pay cut. That doesn't give you enough. The juice isn't worth the squeeze there. So that had to be like 4 to $6 million. And if Leonard Williams turns around and says, no, then you, you have to cut him. You know, it's like, it's one of these things. That an executive told me this one time before, and, and you see it all the time. It happened with Adam Thielen. I just saw this morning. Once a team broaches a pay cut, they have to be prepared to follow through cutting the play because otherwise the relationship is, is so damaged that, you know, it's, you can't just like, hey, I, never mind. I was just kidding about that pay cut. You know, I said, we still value you. So, I don't see them getting to that point. And maybe if they tag Jones, it might have been a little stickier with their cap base. They might have said, listen, we, you have to take this pay cut or we just can't make it work. Maybe that would happen. They can't really play that card with Jones, uh, with Williams' agent. So I think what probably happens – well, I think with the best for all concerned, probably like a short-term extension. Like I looked at Grady Jarrett last year, got a three-year extension around $50 million. I think he's a pretty similar player to Leonard Williams. I think that would be a fair outcome. Leonard gets more guaranteed money but they can knock that uh, cap it this year way down. You're keeping a good player. I mean, I know he had the injuries this year, but I don't know if that's the sign he's breaking down. I mean, the guy had been Iron Man to this point. So I think keeping him in the fold, that because, I mean, the, their defensive line is a weakness, really. So you're going to take the only other really good player besides Dexter Lawrence and make it even weaker. That's hard for me to swallow. So that's why I don't think he'll be cut. Um, 
And then the other option would be a restructure. He has a void year next year. They can push money out there. I think that's probably a last resort. That was the term Shane used a lot last year was restructures for last resorts. Uh, but I, I think the extension makes the most sense now. It's just a matter of, um, you know, Leonard Williams and the agents have been pretty tough negotiators. They've, they've squeezed uh, quite a bit out of the Giants' coffers every time they're at the negotiating table. So uh, maybe that maybe that can't happen. They have to go to the restructure out. It'll be interesting. There's no way I don't think they just leave him at $32 million a year. That's, that's, a, that's a monster cap hit. Yeah, a little bit too much, I think. I mean, it's what, it's what Jones would have got on the tag. So if you're saying that it was exactly. prohibitive of a quarterback with that cap hit, what, what do you think about having an interior defensive line? And so, yeah, they, I think they need to do something. And what that something is kind of remains to be seen. I'm sure we'll find out soon. <laughs> Shay? So, um, obviously, we've got free agency coming up. Um, we have a couple of weeks with free agency. But if we look just a little bit further into the future, in around six weeks' time, all the eyes all turn to Kansas for the NFL draft. Um, so I was just wondering, regarding the draft, obviously we've got quite a few holes, and if you look at the mocks that are going on, we've, we've had a variety of positions mocked us in the first round. Is there any particular player that you personally would like us to take? And maybe not necessarily in the first round, any any point in the draft, is there any standout players that you really like? I'll be honest, I'm not like a big draft guru. Like I kind of take that as it comes. So I haven't, I don't watch college football during the season. I can tell you that part. We'll come back to that. You asked my schedule. Saturday is my day where either I'm traveling or if I'm home, that's, you know, it's kind of a family day. So I just, I don't sit there and watch a lot of college football. I mean, I, 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 I like to say I'm like a, a fast study. I, Dane Brugler, who does all our draft stuff for the athletic is tremendous. So I definitely cram, you know, when the beast drops a couple weeks before the draft, then I got aware of guys for me at the combine and stuff. So I can't say I have a specific guy. I mean, obviously, I know the names of, like, wide receiver and cornerback who could be there at 25, uh, but I can't sit and pretend to have a strong take on them. I'm more focused on free agency at this stage of the game. But I do think – so rather than go a specific player, I think position-wise, wide receiver and cornerback makes the most sense. I mean, obviously, we'll see what happens in free agency. Uh, but, you know, I think Shane's big on you know, using premium resources on premium positions. So you're talking about a first-round pick, right? That's not in the top 10, which, you know, it's a good problem to have. They're not picking up that high for, for a change. Uh, you know, I think you're going to want to use that resource to get one of those high-paid positions so you can have a guy under a cost-controlled contract for the next, you know, four years on a fifth-year option. It's funny, like, where that T. Higgins uh, trade rumors came out and the uh, the Bengals GM shot it down and said, hey, go get your own. And I think that's what the Giants <laughs> need to do. They need to use that 25th pick to go find their T. Higgins, go find their Brandon Ayuk, some of these guys who get tossed around uh, as potential trade targets. It's like, well, those teams – you know, they did the hard part. They scouted that guy. They found that guy in the late first, early second round, and obviously they've been productive players. So I think that should be the Giants' approach. Uh, the cornerback, you know, kind of goes in that same basket where uh, we talked about a Dory, you know, kind of an uncertain future. So I think they need to stock that position up, and I think that's a spot where they can probably get a guy who, you know, be a good number two and with, you know, upside to potentially be a number one. Yeah, and I think if you look at the mock drafts, it's kind of that 25 position is either just going to be Maybe that that'll all just be gone off the board, or we might just say get wide receiver three or cornerback three four to us. If right. the worst to happen and say the wide receivers and cornerbacks are gone, do you think the Giants will maybe target another position, or do you think that maybe Joel Shane will look at maybe moving either up if there's any say one receiver left, or could he move Darren gaining more draft capital either for this year or future years? Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be flexible with it, um, and I think the other thing is, and he said this like. You know, they're, the roster obviously uh, – I mean, they had a good season, but the roster obviously still has some holes. So they, they can't really go wrong with choosing best player available. Like, if there's a offensive guard or center that they love at 25, like, they can go there. If there's a linebacker, they can go there. I mean, there's plenty of positions that they could target there. So uh, I think that they could stay put and, and get a fine player. But, yeah, I mean, I think maybe if there's a little run of wide receivers, say, in the late teens, it wouldn't shock me if they made a kind of a, a small move up to get somebody a 20 or something like that. I don't think they're going to do anything drastic and try and get in the top 10, but you can definitely see if some positions of need uh, start to come off the board. I wouldn't be shocked if they did that or, you know, or vice versa, go the other way. If they just kind of feel like the value is not there, let's go stock up. So yeah, I think, I think kind of all ups are on the table. Uh, it's, it's just interesting, you know, covering a team that has a 25th pick. It's been a while. It's, you know, back to like Evan Ingram. It's like, we're used to covering top 10 where you can narrow it down to like these handful of guys and you knew it'd be one of them. Uh, it's different now. There's such a wide array of uh, variables to determine who will even be there when they're on the clock. But it's a nice problem to have. I'd rather be picking, I'd rather be picking at 25 than the top 10 every year because at least we're playing good football. No doubt. Cool. Um, we're going to finish off just some, with some uh, quick fire questions for you. Um, 
And yeah, I'm back in the room. I had connection issues. I'm good, all good now. Um, so you, when you're sitting back on a Sunday evening and watching watching Sunday night football, which do you rather watch offense or watch the defense? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I say offense. I mean, I'm, when I'm sitting there watching on TV, I'm not trying to get too uh, too advanced with it. So yeah, everyone likes to watch uh, watch the offense light it up. Point scoring. That's what it comes down to, right? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, would you rather watch uh, a player break a run or make a highlight catch? I go highlight catch. You know, like you know, just in the, talking to Odell earlier. It's off the top. You know, like one of those great one-handed catches, which are like you know, he did that, and it was like no one's ever seen him before. I see one like once every couple of weeks, but yeah, I think the the highlight catch is, is pretty cool. Yeah, I think he, he just split, when I, I remember watching that catch on the Sunday night football game, it was the, against the Cowboys, and he just blew up after that. And yeah, it's crazy how something that. I mean, it looks essentially simple, but it's clearly not. But <laughs> just that one play just can have such a huge effect on someone's career after that. Totally. Um, uh, so, talking about jerseys, we've got Giants have got four jerseys. Which do you prefer, Home, Road, Color Rush, or Legacy? Oh, definitely Color Rush. I think the Color Rush should become their road uniforms. I think they're so much better than their... Uh... Their standard runner. I don't get it. They have the red, the big blue. Like, I just, it doesn't even make sense to me. They're, they're road uniform. I'm sure there's some historical thing I'm not even paying attention to, but the, the blue, like the, the white with the blue, I think it's so sharp. I think that should, that should be their new road, full time road uniforms. And I love the old Giants logo on the side of the hair as well. That looks awesome. Cool. Um, what's your biggest highlight covering the Giants in the, in the years that you covered them? Your personal highlight? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, Man, I have to think about that. I mean, obviously, there's like there's stories that you write that really, you know, go viral for lack of a better word. That's cool. Like I did the one on um, Dable, how he assembles coaching staff leading into the playoff game this week, and that really kind of caught like wildfire, which was pretty cool. It's a lot of took a lot of work, a lot of reporting. I didn't really know how we received, and it really uh, got a ton of kind of publicity and attention. So that's that's always a a fun and rewarding feeling. Uh, you know, I broke the. James Bradbury got released last year. That was a story that I was really tracking. So, like, I don't even – like, listen, I try to break every piece of news I can, but I'm also realistic that it's really hard to beat Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport, Mike Garrett, follow those guys to the punch. So when you get one on a fairly big story, like, you know, like a guy like James Bradbury getting released, that definitely feels good. I won't, I won't lie about that. So those, those are the two kind of different categories, like a story that you put a lot of time into and people receive it well, or just a news story that you beat everyone else on. Like, they're both rewarding in their own way. Yeah, it's a it's a nice mark on your name when you get a big story break. <laughs> like take that, right? take it you can get it. You get a pat on the back from the boss. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously you said about you don't really pay much attention to the games in themselves, but do you have do you have a favorite game that you've actually attended? As in like, ooh, um, yeah. And to be clear, when I say I don't pay attention to the games. I mean I don't like have a rooting interest in the games. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so, like, a lot of times it is sort of the experience. Like, I love – the two games in Minnesota uh, were great. Like, that's that's my favorite stadium. I haven't been to Vegas. We'll get there next year. Uh, Minnesota is just an awesome stadium. And the cool part is for for the media, obviously, usually you're in a press box because it's climate controlled and, you know, it's negative degrees out in, you know, Lambeau Field. You don't want to be out in the elements. But since Minnesota's in the dome, it's, it's an open-air press box. There's no plexiglass. So you can really feel and hear the crowd. That definitely uh, bumps it up. And one of the best moments was, so obviously Nick Gates had that quote where after the uh, first game, he said it wasn't as loud as I expected or whatever, and, and it became, literally became bold for material because the fir- I think it was the first offensive snap of the playoff game. He gets called for a holding. So then they put his picture with that quote <laughs> up on, on the big the screen. Video, and, that way, and the place yeah. went nuts. And they got the horn. <laughs> like, it, was, it was a great atmosphere. Obviously, they, you know, they won. Again, I'm sitting there like, they don't root for him, but hey, it's fun when the team he covers wins a big playoff game and everyone's going crazy in the locker room. Like it's, it's, it's I'm not saying like I, you know, totally remove all emotion. Like it was still an enjoyable experience. So that, I mean, maybe that's a little recency bias, but again, there was about five year stretch there where there weren't a lot of memorable games. So, uh, so no, I think yeah, I'd say those two Minnesota games, uh, obviously different outcomes for the Giants, but just the atmosphere for both were really electric and, and really great games and uh, just just fun to be a part of. Nice. Uh, so that kind of probably leads on to the next question. And the your favorite stadium you visited is that yeah, your it's, stadium? It's definitely. It's definitely. I'm trying to think of who even gives it around for more. I mean, Dallas. Maybe I'm a little uh, desensitized because you go every year. 
but that every time you walk in there it really like it lives up to you know the hype and the billing like you know if you go with someone for the first time like uh charlotte carroll my b partner this was her first year covering the nfl so she was experiencing everything the first time and like you could just see her reaction like when she walked in like it, it's 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 really something um that's definitely a great one like i said i'm, I'm looking forward to get to vegas next year uh, was at Seattle this year. I mean, that was definitely as kind of loud as advertised. But now I would say to this point, and maybe it's just the fact that the games were really good too, put it over the top. And Minnesota, uh, it's got the top spot for me. Nice. What about your least favorite stadium? Oh, that's the easiest question of the whole thing. Washington. That place is... <laughs> I knew dumb. you were going to go Washington. I knew you were going to go Washington. It's a dump. It's hard to get to. The food stinks in the press box. The vantage point. I know if you follow us on Twitter, every reporter would just like obligated to tweet the photo from the from the uh, press box where you got like a pole in front of you. <laughs> and, the, and you're like... Like you would think you want to be low, but it's, it's kind of better to have a bird's eye view. And when you're, you're low there, so if the ball's on the other side of the field, you don't know, you know, like I, Saquon runs the ball around right end. You don't know if it's a two yard gain or an eight yard gain because you have no depth perception. I mean, it is, it's the worst. The, the faster Dan Snyder can sell and they can build a new stadium, I think everyone will win if that's the result. It's hopefully coming sooner than later. Yeah, I've had uh, quite a few bad things about so the, uh, about. Washington Stadium. Um, so you said about the the catering in the in the press box. Which stadium has the best catering option? No, that's definitely Dallas. They Jerry does not spare any expenses on anything, and even with the media, Literally. takes takes care of us. Uh, and, I, and so they played there on Thanksgiving this year. So like, I didn't want to tell my mother this or my wife this, but like the spread I got in the press box probably better than what it would, would have got if I stayed home. I mean, they really they have carving <laughs> stations and every side and desserts. I mean, they really. They went all out, and that's just standard. They they have really good food, and it's it's high quality and a lot of it. So yeah, that's they're they're certainly number one uh, in the rankings, in my opinion, for food. I mean, everything's bigger in Dallas, right? Yeah, I mean, they like I said, Jerry Jones is not someone who 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 spares any expense on anything. So even taking care of the media, he goes all out. Yeah. So um, last couple. So who's the funniest, either current or past player that you've ever interviewed? Oh man, these are good. They put me on the spot. My mind's not uh, firing as quick <laughs> as it needs to be. Funniest player. I'm trying to just, like, go through the guys on the team now. Um, give Give me a second to think about that. Ask me the next one. And I'll, I'll try. No and, worries. I'll try and work on that one. <laughs> the, the next one might not be any easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, okay, go with the current players. Go go in the current current squads from last year. Who? who Who's probably the funniest out of the current squad? Yeah, so I'm trying to think. Like, who's funny? And like, I'm trying to think. Does anyone have qualified like funny? Like, like Dexter Lawrence has like a, a, a like a jovial personality. I don't know if I'd say he's funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Graham Gano is actually kind of sneaky funny. Like he's he would not, you know I think kickers are always kind of like putting their own bucket, but he's got a pretty good personality. He's kind of always in the mix. Like I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody kind of obvious, but th- uh, that's that's the best I can do on the spot. I'm sure. I'm sure they won't take. It. What about uh, what about Haddy? Oh my gosh! See, there it is. Yes, Haddy, Haddy strikes me as someone who is crazy to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, next if you ask anymore, and I'm dying on the vine like that. Feel free to offer suggestions. Haddy definitely <laughs> easily. Yes, I mean he is. He's one of the biggest personalities I've ever covered. I mean, you guys see just the stuff with the flipping the birds to the cameras and doing <laughs> somersaults on the. That's just on the field. In the locker room, it's a whole. I mean, he is. Yes, absolutely hot. I knew I was kind of forgetting somebody. He is he's kind of a larger than life character. He's 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 a trip. I hope he's back again for selfish purposes. I hope he's back because he's just an entertaining guy to cover and be around. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised he's up there. Yeah, um, that's a last, great one. last one then. So you're at dinner and you get your dream three guests to have dinner with. Who are they and why? From any walk of life? Any walk of life. Yeah. Oh boy, <laughs> uh, hottie. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, let me think about. I'll try and give some th- three. So, I think I'm just first one that's come to mind. I think I'd have to go with Larry David just because I'm a big Seinfeld, Kirby enthusiasm guy. Cool. I think man. He would be very interesting to just you know be around and hear his you know sort of thoughts on the world. The dinner would be entertaining for sure. Uh, Again, going back to my basketball in Boston roots, I probably have to say Larry Bird. Just uh, now, I kind of was a little young to really be a, a huge fan of his, but he was still the guy when you grew up in Boston. Uh, 
So I'd say he'd be kind of a, a cool one to have. And then one more. Man, there's got to be somebody obvious that I'm forgetting. So you've gone TV, I mean, you've gone sports. What about someone from music or... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess my favorite musician is Tom Petty. I don't know if like he would be an unbelievable dinner guest, but you you gave me that hint, so I'll go with that one. Well, maybe yeah, I'll change Tom my mind. Petty, man. I'll forgive him with that. <laughs> that's a that's a that's going to be a great dinner, and you can sit down and chill with them for you. That'd be really cool. Some uh, some decent guests there as well. Actually, I like that. <laughs> Cool. That's the uh, that's the end of the quick fire questions, and that's the end of all of our questions for you, Dan. Um, <laughs> but we uh, we just want to uh, again just reiterate. So, like you taking the time out to speak to us, I know it's been the best part of forty five minutes, but um, we um, like appreciate you coming on to speak to us this evening, this afternoon. Um, you know, we love love the work you do with the the Athletic. Uh, love the work Charlotte does as well. Your your beat partner as well. It's you know. You, you two guys are the, are the main reason the three of us subscribe to Athletic. So, you know, we really appreciate your work. We really appreciate your time. Um, and hopefully it's not the last time that we get to speak to you either. Yeah, no, I, my pleasure coming on. It's cool to have, uh, to know that there's people, you know, reading kind of all over the world. So that, that's really cool. And uh, yeah, no, definitely. Craig has my email. So, um, so hit me up. And we'll, we'll do it again <laughs> he for sure. He no doubt will. We're, we're, uh, we're planning on coming over to the States later on in, in the year to, uh, to a game, the game day weekend. So uh, it'd be oh, cool if we could just hook up with her and just say hey and, you know, grow a beer or something at some point. Yeah, that'd be great. Hit me up. Awesome. But yeah, I really appreciate your time, man. And um, thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Cool. Uh, that is all we've got time for this time around, Giants fans. Uh, we will be back next week at our usual spot, 8.30 on Wednesday evening, uh, to talk all things free agency. Um, anything else to add before we go, Craig or Shane? No, nah, just great interview. Um, no offence to anyone else previously, but probably the, the number one interview that we've had since we've been going. So uh, thanks ever so much for joining us. I also think that Kev would be very, very upset if we didn't mention that he was so upset that he couldn't be on here tonight. He's at a country music festival at the O2, and he even joined us from the Hotel Romalia just to say that we had to reiterate that he loves he loves reading the articles as well. Um, and yeah, we've... Um, We'll have to reach out to Charlotte and have her on. So we'd love to, un you know, get some in insight into how her, how her first year has gone because um, we've all loved reading her stuff too. So, Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Glad we could do this. Yeah, man. Cheers. No, for sure. We're, uh, we're glad you could join us. Uh, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that little bell to get the latest updates and notifications. Follow us on Twitter, on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Big Blue UK in Ireland. Uh, you can also find us on the New York Giants Fans UK Facebook page. Get in touch with us via email to bigblueukiro at gmail.com. Um, my thanks as ever go to Shane and to Craig and to you, Dan, for joining us uh, and to you, the listeners, for tuning in. We are signing off until next time. Mm -hmm.